Women on Wealth is proudly sponsored by First for Women. Celebrating leading women. She was one of a handful of people who wrote South Africa's constitution and to this day she remains a fearless protector of the country's moral compass. This is Women and Wealth and I am Nozi Pombanjo. Tonight we profile South Africa's public protector Tulima Donzela and we also speak to a representative from the South African Women Lawyers Association to find out whether women are winning in the courtroom. And in Power Redefined, we bring you the first African woman to be sworn in as a judge at the Hague's International Court of Justice. That's Ugandan-born Julia Sebutinde. Advocate Tuli Matontala's job is to protect the South African public, promote good governance and root out corruption. Her tenure has been both controversial and an uphill battle. A short while ago, I sat down with her at the Extraordinary South Africans event. I asked if she could turn back time, would she still take up the post of public protector? Absolutely. I have more reason to take it up now than I had then because I know that I've been able to make a difference and I would know then that I would make a difference. How do you then balance the responsibility that you have for the country with at the same time the responsibility that you have as a mother to a family? Well, my responsibilities as a mother have become less and less because my children uh, are fairly old. Although your children will always be your children, my daughter is 22 and studying law. My son is about 25, doing part-time business studies and trying to um, to start uh, his own business. They don't need me as much as small children. I think the challenge was when I was uh, still working in the Department of Justice and adverts, where they really had to come to work with me. And how do you deal with the, the personal criticism that has been leveled uh, at you, in particular over and above the institution, but attacks on your person? Well, I forgive the people that attack me because I honestly think they don't know what they're doing. If they knew better, they would do better. When the criticism is rational and talking about the law and the facts, I think there's nothing wrong with that because when people focus on the law or facts, uh, we grow as an institution and we talk about learning and growing together. So we we'll welcome people discussing our findings and our remedial action from a rational point of view. And where do you draw your inspiration from to give you the strength of character to carry out this job that you do so well? Various places. My creator, as I said earlier, I consider this to be part of my purpose in life and I consider it a privilege to be able to serve the people and make a difference every day in terms of changing people's lives, getting people their jobs back, getting their, them their money back. And, and seeing the joy it brings to their lives, bring back money when it has been abused so that that money can pay for a school toilet, school books and roads in uh, villages where children have no school days because the roads are bad. That gives me inspiration, but uh, I also get inspiration from the team I work with. Just a little over 300 people, they work beyond the call of duty. They truly believe in the work they do. They truly believe in the purpose of the organization and their individual purposes in the pursuit of the organizational purpose. And they give it all. They work at night if they have to, weekends. And when there's criticism from the country, they're the first to, to dismiss it yeah. if, the, if the criticism is irrational. You've always been a, a champion and a fighter for gender equality. Do you think that the judicial system in South Africa works for women? It does. Uh, it's better than it used to be. However, as Madiba once said, we inherited a state that needed to be transformed. The state was insular and was not responsive to the diverse needs of the people of South Africa. 
for it was always going to be challenged to make sure that the criminal justice system understands, for example, gender-based violence, uh, which would have meant social context training for judges, for magistrates, for prosecutors, and for probation officers. And that journey has not reached its destination yet. Uh, it's a journey that we're undertaking, but we're on the right track. It's a painful journey, and change is painful, but change is taking place. We understand that this is a non-renewable term. When it comes to an end, what can we expect from Tuli? Well, claiming, reclaiming my life, I'm a lawyer, I'm uh, a, a, an equality activist and somebody who has always had taken an interest in the Constitution. You'll see me writing a bit about my experiences here, just the personal journey. But a lot of my time in the future will be spent in practicing law and writing about maladministration, the cost of maladministration on people's lives, which is similar to crime in some respects, and also the opportunities though for government to make a difference when these injustices are uncovered. And talking about the stories where government has stepped out and made a difference, and also the stories where we will be too late because government didn't come to, to the party in time, as lessons that need to be learned to make sure that we really do understand that the drafters of our constitution wanted us to deal with maladministration because it does destroy lives. Earlier today you said that a woman's place is where she wants to be. So kindly, kindly elaborate. Well, I was referring to Olive Schreiner, who started talking about that and in the 18-somethings, you know, and it was difficult times. Um, we are lucky that our constitution now affirms that, that a woman's place is where she chooses to be. And hence, if she wants to be a mother, she should have laws and facilities that support that and be free from domestic violence. If she wants to be a judge, she should be a judge. If she wants to be in politics, she can do that. It's really about uh, freeing the potential of every person, men and women, and improving the quality of life of every person, which is a constitutional requirement because it requires that everyone's life should be progressively improved and gender and other forms of equality should be progressively achieved by government working with civil society, including the corporate world. Mm. And finally, what is your understanding of the concept of wealth? Well, I see wealth in terms of the concept of abundance. Wealth includes life, being healthy. Uh, wealth includes living a joyful life. I also see wealth as financial in some way, but financial coming not from just getting the wealth from, uh, from no contribution of your own. I see wealth as being, the financial side of wealth, being life rewarding you for what you have given to life yourself. Over 60% of attorneys in South Africa are men, but the number of female students studying law at the country's universities paints a hopeful picture for gender equality in the profession. Earlier I sat down with attorney Kidiboni Mulema to find out how well women are doing in terms of transforming the profession of law. I must say that as Saula we feel that the government is making sufficient efforts in that direction. The associations of lawyers, both, all of them, I, I come from Saula specifically, the South African Women Lawyers Association, but all those bodies mm. are, have a, embraced that it's necessary to have transformation mm. of the profession. So mm. it's happening uh, at different levels, yeah. maybe not at the rate that we would have loved it to happen, mm. but it is happening and I believe that the pace is picking up. The pace is picking up. What value uh, do female lawyers and attorneys and judges bring to the courtroom that is over and above what their male counterparts do? Well, the legal profession is a profession. So uh, theoretically, it's not supposed to be about gender. Mm. It's not supposed to make a difference whether one is female or a uh, male because there are certain norms and standards and laws within which the profession operates. But I can assure you 
that uh, there are those nuances yeah. of the involvement of women. For example, in the recent case of Oscar Pistorius, Oscar Pistorius you'll have heard that uh, it, it was uh, some people expressed the view that because the judge consent well, is a female, mm. she was bringing the element of womanhood into it in that as a mother she was more sympathetic to Oscar mm. than maybe a male judge would have been. I don't know if that is a correct yeah. assumption, but the point is that there are those nuances mm. and maybe it's there, maybe it's not there, maybe it's just that as, an, a, a, as a judge, yeah. her thinking led her to the decision that she made and it had nothing to do with whether she's a woman or a man. What about the money? I mean, to a large extent, we always see uh, males uh, heading up the high-profile cases. Uh, are women uh, getting to the front of high-profile cases where they can make serious money? Yes, women are doing that and more and more as our society uh, becomes conscientized mm. to the need for transformation and more welcoming to women in the profession. You know, we've come a long way from the time when women were supposed to be barefoot, pregnant, and <laughs> having babies in the house. Uh, now, women are accepted in the professions. And thus, we have seen a, a lot of, for example, for a long time, we had a, a woman as a, an acting national director of public prosecutions. Yes. We have quite a few of those. And we have, we, we, I, can I can remember uh, advocate, um, an advocate who was the, pro, uh, the, the legal advisor to President Tabombeki when he was in office, Mujangu mm. Gumbi. And there are other women who are sitting in the boardrooms uh, uh, and who are going into the, the, the judiciary. So women are, they, there is still this uh, proverbial a glass ceiling yes. but if it's glass it's fragile and if you're brave enough you can hit it with your head get a few bruises but you can <laughs> go in every week we bring you a woman who is flexing her power muscles on the global stage let's take a look at ugandan judge julia sebutinde Julia Sebutinde was appointed judge of the High Court of Uganda in 1996 and made a name for herself by chairing a number of high-level commissions investigating allegations of corruption in the Ugandan Police Force, Ministry of Defence and Revenue Authority. She served as a judge for a special UN-backed court for Sierra Leone before becoming only the fourth woman and first ever African woman to sit on the International Court of Justice in The Hague. She's a goodwill ambassador for the United Nations Population Fund program and a strong advocate for the rights of women globally. That's all from Women on Wealth this week. Be sure to pick up a copy of this Sunday City Press to find out more about another winning woman, the new president of the Business Women's Association of South Africa. That's Fazana Mall. Remember to keep the conversation alive on Twitter. That's by following me at Nozi Pombandra and, of course, using our hashtag WOW410. We want to know who is redefining the concept of power in your world. Until next time, stay empowered. Mm -hmm.